Again, welcome. My name is Lillian McEnany. I am an assistant curator at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. And as you all know, we are here to kick off our collecting or to continue our collecting jewelry lecture series. To begin, I'd like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, at least on my end, even though we are in a virtual space, in Ogopoge within the Tewa world. As a non-Native person in the so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people, and I wish to acknowledge all the Indigenous people and communities, Pueblo, Diné, Apache, and so many others, past, present, and future, who walk on these lands and steward this place. So as many of you know, this lecture series began last month with a virtual tour of the exhibition with curator Ross Altschuler, who is here with us today. Um, and we are continuing the conversation today with an artist panel with Alan Aragon and Jennifer Curtis. Michael Roanhorse was able to join us today, um, but we hope to schedule um, with him at a later date. So stay tuned for that. Um, I think maybe we should go around our Zoom room and introduce ourselves. Um, and so for the viewers who don't know you, Alan and Jennifer, Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves, um, kind of where you're from, what you do, and a little bit about your work? Uh, my name is Alan Aragon. I'm from the Navajo Nation. I grew up in uh, Crown Point area, New Mexico, northwestern New Mexico by Chaco Canyon. I was raised on a ranch out in that area. Um, when I was a kid, I would start uh, looking at pottery pieces, all the pottery shard that I seen on horseback. And I was always influenced by the old pottery pieces that I found as a kid and see the turquoise bees on the ant piles and stuff as a kid. And I think that uh, something like that's always influenced me on my work. Um, I live in Albuquerque. I do more like contemporary style, which is pottery hand painting with uh, glazes, then kiln fired, and then I, I do set them in silver. So my, my work is kind of more like real contemporary, but it does have like a real, uh, the designs are traditional designs put more in a, in a contemporary style. That is great. Um, I think we're gonna dig into your influences a little bit later on. Um, okay. But so Jennifer, um, you wanna go ahead? Hi, I, I'm Jennifer Curtis. And I'm originally from Northern Arizona, north of Winslow, uh, raised, born and raised there. And um, I learned from my father, the late Thomas Curtis Sr. Uh, uh, I just, you know, was always influenced by my dad and whatever he did. And he was my teacher, uh, my master. And so I just picked it up from him, but he never forced me to be a jeweler. And so I kind of just picked it up on my own. Great, thank you both. Um, Alan, I'm gonna kick it back to you. Um, obviously you're known for working with pottery and um, can you just tell us a little bit more about the uh, mixed media pieces that you do, especially for those in the audience who might not be familiar with your work and um, just talk about why you um, work in that way. Uh, like I was saying, I was raised on a ranch finding like pottery pieces when I was younger and it was, you know, as a kid, going to like the rug auctions and stuff that they used to have in Crown Point at the elementary school, they would have a lot of vendors sell their their work and pottery. And an Acoma lady uh, has seen that I, you know, interested in pottery, and she had given me a piece of clay and told me to to start working in it. And that kind of was one of my influences on the style of work I do now. But it's the work I do is more commercial clay, it's not like the traditional clay, so because it's kiln fired glaze, and then after that's it's set in silver. So it's, it's a real contemporary look. Do you have samples of your work, Alan? I do, I gotta, let me, I gotta get out, real, out of my chair. Real quick. <laughs> I, I want the, the audience to visually see that. It's kind of hard to imagine. Yep. I don't know, can you see there? Oh well, yeah. Yeah, it's a bolo tie, so. Mm -hmm. Nice. And that has like a yay traditional, a yay design on it. 
it's more of a real person look, I guess you could say. Yeah. And that's the style of work I do. And you mentioned that you work in commercial clay. Um, what do you see the benefit of that being for your particular work? On my work, it has to be more of a, of a higher fire because it's uh, set in silver and the color base is, is fired on. Uh, if, I, if I use more of the traditional clays, it's not uh, strong enough or it, the colors wouldn't hold up well that I use to, uh, with the modern paints and pigments instead of the, the natural pigments. So I use the commercial because it's more sturdy and keeps the color like the brighter colors from fading or nothing. So that's one reason I use that. Um, so Jennifer, I'm going to pose the same question to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit more? I know you said that you learned um, from your father. Can you tell us more about how you became interested in jewelry making and kind of what that learning process was for you? Um, well, I was always around my dad, you know, as a, as a kid. So, uh, but I never imagined that I was going to be a full-time artist um, ever as uh, I, I, you know, had planned to be uh, an architecture and uh, I went to school, I have a degree in CAD, but here I am, I don't even know about computers, you know, <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, I always admired uh, my father's work and how he created and, uh, I was always interested in mechanical, on-hand mechanical, you know, putting gadgets together. So I used to do a uh, model, you know, like uh, car parts and stuff like that, that I was always interested in putting together and seeing how it developed. So that kind of, you know, started with jewelry making. And then I learned all the basic techniques from my dad uh, but this was way back in the day. I went to college. I went to a higher education right after high school. Uh, but I came back, came back in full circle back in 1986, somewhere in that area. Uh, and uh, starving, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. So. I, uh, I came back to my dad and said, you know what, dad, I don't know what I'm doing out there, but I'm going to pick up, you know, from, from you, I'm going to learn all the uh, basics of what you're doing. So he said, sure. So uh, back in 89, that was my first Indian market and we cleaned house. Uh, so uh, my, my work was more contemporary. I did a lot of etching with rug patterns. Uh, that's how my, my work had started back then. But uh, as I progressed, uh, I kind of integrated both my, my contemporary with my dad's traditional techniques. And so I had kind of both. And I didn't want to take from my dad, but he had already established. So that kind of, you know, putting the two together kind of made it different. My jewelry. But as the years went, you know, uh, after losing my dad, I, I seem like I went full force to traditional jewelry now. That's, that's what I do. Thank you for sharing that. It's so interesting to hear, um, Ellen, that you are so influenced by pottery and that's so visually apparent in your work. And Jennifer, that you had um, started thinking about integrating rug patterns into your jewelry making. So kind of bringing the three art forms together. Um, very cool. Um, Ross, while we're on this subject, do you have um, any questions that you would like to pose? to our two panels. And Alan, uh, where did you uh, learn how to do silver work? The silver work, uh, my mom did a little silver work when she was younger. And just oh, really? curiosity of, of trying, trying a little bit of it and buying uh, all those basic silver supplies. 
I really had no uh, other way of learning. My mom was just kind of like a as a hobby. Just she didn't do it really to sell when I was younger, but I, I just tried it and and a lot of mistakes. But you learn over the years just by practicing and trying something. And I would get a lot of native art books and stuff and look at the type of tools that other artists use and just mm. buy, bought things and try to ask questions a lot of that that's the worst of places now obviously when you're making a bolo or you're making a, a belt um uh you are referencing something that has existed from a, a long time from historic pieces um, did you ever look at old belts, for example, or uh, uh, to get an idea of how to design the uh, belt that you made or, or whatever? I am, yeah, looking at old pieces, like my grandfather had an old buckle that he had that was made probably in the mid 60s. And just the style of work, I would, you know, study the concho belts and the bezel on them and then the beads that they would use or their hammering. And I, you know, just look mm -hmm. at things like that. And I do a lot of the teardrops and the stamping on some of the pieces I do now. So I did have a lot of influence from old pieces that I looked at when I was younger. Okay, I understand. Uh, Jennifer, did you find anything? Yeah, I, I was uh, <laughs> surprised at, at what I have. So what I, when I was talking about contemporary rug patterns, and by the way, uh, both of my grandmothers were rug weavers. So I was also influenced by their uh, rug patterns. Ah. So this is, uh, I don't know if you can see uh, the etching. Yeah, there. we can see. Yeah. The, the rug pattern, because I don't see myself. That's why I, I can't even tell. So, um, but this is uh, what yeah, I was talking good. about uh, as far as starting off. This is how I started off my work. And then um, uh, this is uh, a, a work in progress, uh, squash blossom. Oh, wow. And I'm making that's a set. Beautiful. I'm making a set of uh, uh, earrings to go with it. I don't know if you can see them. Can yeah. You yeah. A little bit closer to the camera, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Here's a, an, an earring. You see that? Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. That's yeah. cool. And then uh, a bracelet. It's still in process, uh, progress here. Yeah. Spectacular. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. I would maybe throw the same question to you that um, Ross just asked Alan about. Um, the value of historic collections, either in your own home or in museums. Um, do you ever look to older pieces for inspiration for your work? Oh yeah, I have. Uh, I totally admire uh, how all this begun, you know, in the earlier years. Um, it's very interesting how primitive their tools were, you know, um, each stage of how this all came about, our tools. Uh, I, uh, I'm totally fascinated by how their stamping tools came, you know, the bump out tools. Uh, I mean, it's very impressive on, you know, say that now we, it's, you know, it's all machine made here, but back then they didn't have the equipment that we do now. So it's, it's uh, mind blown how these uh, uh, previous artists came, uh, came through with all these designs and uh, stamps. Yeah, and that's something that Ross, um, you focus a lot on in the exhibition um, about the historic tools. Do you want to speak a little bit about that for the viewers who maybe haven't seen the exhibit? Yeah, what uh, when I started putting this exhibit together, what really impressed me was the uh, variety of styles and variety of techniques that these early jewelers 
basically created on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, today, um, a modern jeweler has the ability to look back and see different designs and, and get ideas. Oh, yeah. These jewelers, when they started out, really had no reference point. Mm -hmm. So they were creating these styles and, and, and developing these techniques by themselves. And that really impressed me because they came up with such a variety of beautiful pieces. Uh, and it was just incredible to think uh, that, uh, for example, that they used uh, a bellows to heat a fire. They didn't yeah. have a blowtorch to, uh, to heat up their uh, uh, piece of metal. Um, and obviously, uh, I know in some of the pieces that were cast pieces, and they were trying to, they were thick, heavy pieces of silver, and they were trying to bend that into a bracelet by heating it in the fire with the bellows. They couldn't get it quite hot enough, and a lot of times it would crack when they were bending it, and you could see the evidence of that on the back of the bracelet. and. Uh, you know, as time went on, of course, they developed that they were that they uh, acquired better tools like a blowtorch, and uh, they acquired some actual pre-made stamps and so on, and and the work became a little more sophisticated at that point. But still, the early uh, pieces that they made were incredibly beautiful, incredibly well crafted. And, it, and it's just uh, almost mind blowing that they were able to do that with, with the tools and, and uh, uh, facilities that they had at the time. So that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this uh, exhibit was to be able to show those things and to explain those things a little bit. Now, uh, uh, Jennifer, by the way, uh, you know, I know that uh, your work, you may have uh, recently gone back to uh, creating a little more traditional style, but I always noticed that you always took a traditional style and added to it or uh, added your own new creativity to it to change it and make it yours. Um, Maybe you can explain a little bit about how you did that. Well, I was always influenced by the uh, early, real early uh, 1950s or earlier uh, castings that they did, uh, more profoundly uh, buckles. So I kind of just, you know, uh, based it off of how it was laid out. But then I uh, went in with more modern shapes and just add to that motif, uh, sort of, to make it, you know, kind of merge the both together. Uh, that's yeah. how I got influenced through that. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. No. I know it's a hard question to really. Yeah, uh, uh, but know, that's why you know that's how I uh, going back and forth, you know, with with back then into now. Uh, that's how I change some of my work, and uh, I wish I had more time now to do more of those designs. Uh, but I, you know, I'm also influenced by Fred Harvey uh, era. Uh, hmm. Uh, how that and and you know I want to do a series of that as well, and I haven't really had time to do all that. Too many orders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You go ahead. I, I was going to ask Alan. I know over the years his designs on the pieces have evolved and changed. And how has that occurred? I when I first started, I used to use just like browns, black, and white, just simple three colors. Hmm. And over the years, like now I use like 
probably 20 different colors of blends of, of paints that I use. So yeah, it, I think just trying to, you know, you start something, you want to try something new, a new look, keep yourself from getting bored to expand the different <laughs> areas, yeah. different colors, different designs. Yeah, because I noticed your designs have gotten more uh, uh, complicated uh, as time went on. Like the bolo that you just showed us had a very yeah. intricate pattern on it, which yeah. you know, I remember detail, your yeah. early work was more more simple. Yes, it was. Yeah, my I get bored, I guess, with with doing the same patterns. So I'm I'm always trying to do something a little different. How long did it take you to make that bolo, for example, to do that? Uh, painting? Just, the painting time on it was. Probably like three weeks. I don't work on it. Wow. I only work on it when I when I feel like I'm work. I, I, you know, I'm not. I don't want. I don't like to work. Yeah, on you're not working eight it. hours a day on it. Yeah. Yeah. So I just set it down and come back to it, and I have sometimes like four or five pieces that I'll have rotate and just move mm -hmm. them around when I feel like working on one and just work that way. And, and uh, Jennifer, of course, mentioned that when she started out, she was using a lot of rug design that she was etching into the silver. Do you ever use rug designs in your pieces that you paint? I do. I do some rug designs. My mom's a rug weaver. My grandmother was a rug weaver. So there's always some rug patterns that I, that I do in some of them. Yeah, and I see you've got a couple of beautiful rugs at the... Uh, Right behind you there. Yeah, it's amazing work what the Navajo weavers do. All very time consuming. So, oh yeah. Okay, Bross, back to yes. uh, kind of. I wanted to show a, a picture of one of my buckles that I was talking about as far as uh, the ah. old pre, uh, sand casting. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Yes, we can. Wow. And that's cast? No, this is all, I don't cast any of my work, uh, but uh, it's, it's just a, a sample of one of my books from an older version of a, of a sand cast. That's really incredible. Beautiful. Jennifer, we have a question from the audience um, about your use of stone. Um, do you ever use any stone other than turquoise? I use faceted stones. I use uh, different variations of capstones when I'm asked to use them. But uh, but foremost, I just I always just use silver, no stones. You know, uh, there's been a lot of digging up turquoise and you know all the resources are running out so my father and I used to always talk about that uh, what's gonna what's gonna happen when you know all the turquoise is gone you know all the uh, stones you know people are how they're gonna be able to create from not having any of those so I already started off to, you know, just make all my stuff, just all silver, um, to kind of stay ahead of the game here. Turquoise is also getting very expensive. Yes, it is. For good quality, uh, natural uh, American turquoise in particular. It's but there is still a huge quantity of stuff coming from China. Maybe not now with all the... Uh, problems with deliveries and shipments and all of that but but there's still a lot of mining being done there and uh, it seems that there's always a new mine in especially in Nevada uh, that people are coming up with so I think there'll still be a flow of turquoise but it probably yeah. is not going to be cheap probably not you know I uh, the guys they, they don't share where they get their stones from either you know yeah, <laughs> the top secret kind of deal, you know. So, mm. um, and so as we're thinking about the future of resource extraction and turquoise, um, 
right now, I'm wondering um, if either of you could speak to kind of the state of contemporary Navajo jewelry right now and where you see the field going um, based on the different work that you and your um, colleagues and friends are all doing. Well, the, yeah. the techniques have, are definitely changing uh, with the um, equipment that are now available to us like uh, more machine process. Um, I don't know if Alan sees that as well. Uh, we have some of our friends that uh, do a lot of, uh, for instance, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, Pat Pruitt, you know, he does a lot of uh, machine process lasers and stuff like that, that he uh, uses to make his jewelry. Uh, I don't know, Alan has, uh, anything, anyone else that he has in mind. Uh, the way that was just one of my examples uh, as far as how, where our jewelry uh, process uh, is, is going, you know, it's, it seems to be uh, more productive, you know, mm. uh, than, than just real handmade anymore. Uh, there's a few of us, it seems, that are still the basic uh, handmade process. Uh, that's how I see it anyway. Uh, I don't know uh, what everyone else sees. Do you ever, uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, when you were in school, you, you learned how to use uh, uh, the CAD uh, techniques. Uh, do you ever uh, use that in designing your jewelry at this point? Uh, no, I I didn't have I don't I just recently purchased a computer. Uh, <laughs> I see. Uh, so I never I haven't even you know gone back to uh, see if I could be able to do that. But uh, I sketch some of my pieces you know before I start. Yeah. Like for instance, yeah. that wash blossom. I, I kind of sketched out what I had in mind. Um, but, you know, uh, but that's where it's it leading to. Some of these guys are using bad 3D versions to come up with their their work. And the, uh, now I'm, I'm seeing 3D uh, moldings, you know, uh, or wax carving that's computerized, you know. Mm. There's, there, those are the some of the stuff that's coming about uh, at this uh, you know stage in the process of all of how primitive it was to to now uh, the techniques are are changing and uh, you know it, it's still uh, somewhat challenging to figure out all the me mechanism of you know, putting things together. But it seems to uh, be more about um, working easier, you know, because, yeah. because uh, what I do is very physical, stamping all day, you know, um, just, uh, it's different from what, how Ellen's doing his jewelry. We're all kind of unique and, you know, of how, how we create, but more is, mine is uh, intense, you know, just hammering away all the time, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. And it's just repetitive. So, you know, you start to wear out on, on your arm. Uh, so I'm kind of, you know, it, I can feel it. It's, uh, it's wearing me down and I'm also trying to figure out what would be easier for me. And so I look up to Pat and, you know, all these other guys that are, uh, they, they also influence me, you know, it's like, you know, I want to make things easier for me too, because I'm not getting younger, you know? Yeah. I would love to hear your perspective on this conversation. Like uh, different styles of work but, um, nowadays compared to it was 20 years ago is a big difference. A lot of, computerized 3D printing, um, like molding castings, uh, hydraulic press, forming the rings and 
bracelets, a lot more different newer techniques a lot of artists are using, okay, which is makes it a lot easier, less labor intense. Um, but like Jennifer's at work is all hand stamp and you know, you know, I don't think she does use any of the press and stuff like that. But you know, work like the older way compared to now, there's always easier steps that they're coming up with new tools, uh, drill bits and just engraving tools, a lot more modern equipment that you can use to even just hold the hold the jewelry pieces, the silver, uh, the cleaning process, um, buffing to um, putting them in a tumbler and stuff like that. So there's a lot more new techniques that help uh, the new jewelers compared to how the old style used to do. When when you uh, do you draw out your designs on with pencil and paper kind of thing? I do a roughly pencil them? outline on on the clay pieces, and then I'd like like a oh you draw oh, directly like on the clay. You. Yeah, and so I'll do like the face a round circle on it, and I just paint uh you know the main design just that it's even, and I just paint as I go and fill it in. So oh. I just mostly paint as I go and look at it. That's how I do. I don't nice. easily draw them out the whole thing or nothing. I just kind of just go go with the flow on it. And to do the silver work that you uh, uh, mount the pieces in and so on, uh, what kind of equipment do you have? Do you use? I just buy the, the pre-made bezel, just like a plain. Ah. And then I, I after the, the, the piece is fired in the kiln and ready, and then I'll measure and form the bezel around the pottery piece. And then I'll go off by that and solder it onto the, to the back and then add the stamping or the teardrops. And that's how I do a line. Great. Um, so we don't have any other questions from the audience right now. Um, so I'd love to hear um, Jennifer and Alan, if there are other things um, that you would love to talk to Mayak audiences about, either about your own work or um, just about the state of the field today. Well, uh, we're also talking about how uh, stamps were made back then to now. Uh, my dad, uh, he was also uh, a blacksmith. So he used to collect a lot of old files. Uh, and uh, he did a lot of his uh, stamps from old files. Let me uh, get a couple here. So. Uh, here's some examples of uh, real old uh, hard steel files. And my dad was very uh, collective of uh, files that he shot for. And uh, that's uh, how he used to make his stats from old files. And he knew how to temper it, and they last. Some of these stamps are even older than I am, believe it or not. Yeah. And I, I'm 57 right now, so it's amazing. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing how they're holding up. Uh, some I don't use a lot of, you know, uh, as I'm trying to reserve uh, the life out of them so that I could pass it down. I have one nephew that. That's my apprentice right now, trying to teach him. He's interested in it. You know, I I don't also I don't I'm not forcing anyone of my family to learn this jewelry business. And but it would be nice, you know, to carry on my father's legacy. Uh, but uh, I wanted to point that out too. You know the 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 stamp making, and there's also uh, repas days. These days, there's a lot of bump belt tools that are being made, you know, a lot of jewelers use now. And it just uh, makes it easier uh, than a uh, real uh, repas day process. And that takes time and the depth of, you know, the height of the bump belt, you know, all that takes time too. And so now there's there's just a lot of bump belt tools developed 
out there and it's available at, at the convenience for our, our, you know, all the jewelers that, that are now doing uh, jewelry. So they're making, uh, what, what are they, metal uh, oh, plates yeah. with uh, uh, different shapes on them? Yeah. So let's say uh, somebody wants to make a conco belt. And this is a, an example of a bump belt. I got you. You put your silver here, and then uh, you just hammer that down so your, your, your silver uh, shapes according to this pattern here. Right. So this is a bump belt, and it's very different from the repose work. You know, that's all, all a different technique. Here's another. Ah. And that one. Uh, comes out like that. Yeah. So hey, thank you for sharing those. That's yeah. Fantastic. Uh-huh. Uh, I, you know, it's kind of hard to just imagine what I'm actually talking about. So it's, it's better to show the audience uh, what we're referencing to. Okay. We have another question from the audience um, about classes. And I, it came in while you were talking, Jennifer, but maybe both of you can speak to this. Um, it's just if you offer classes to the general public, this is a question from Sheila. Uh -huh. I have never done classes or nothing, but I, I do my work demonstrations and stuff here at the shop and people are always welcome to come by and, and watch and, and see how I do the, the jewelry pieces. My, my shop is in Old Town Albuquerque. It's in the patio market. And it's, it's on the uh, Allen Ergon Gallery. And I have a little work. I call it my timeout table where I paint. So like I do all my painting there, all my, all my jewelry. My civil work I do at home. But anybody's always welcome to stop by and watch me and I can explain how it's done. Okay. Yeah, because I I know I personally have gone uh, down to Allen's shop and watched him work as well. So it's very interesting to see how he does those really intricate, minute designs. It's So with uh, Jennifer, her hands and arms uh, hurt from all the pounding she does and <laughs> Allen, his eyes must uh, must be artists pretty get sharp to be able to do that. Yeah, I think all us artists get aches and pains as we get older, Ross. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can identify as well. Yeah. Well, I uh, I always uh, encourage uh, whoever wants to learn how to uh, stamp. Uh, you know, I'm willing to share what I learned, what I know. Uh, I don't know everything. I'm still learning myself, but uh, I guess I can leave my information with Ross or. Absolutely. And uh, they can reach out and if they want to learn some basic stuff from me, I, you know, they're, they're more than welcome to come to my studio and I'm in Albuquerque. Actually. You might find another apprentice. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> Get them to do the pounding. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I think we have, well, we have one comment um, from Connie Kassan, um saying that she would also like to be included in the tour, Ross, <laughs> um, and to thank um, all of you for this wonderful and very inspiring interview. Um, so I think that's a great place to leave it. I think we're at a good spot, um, unless there is anything else that you all want to talk about before we sign off for the morning. Thank you guys for the invite and to be involved in the conversation. So I appreciate it. And thank you for being here. And um, the a recording of this conversation will be made available on our YouTube page in the coming weeks. So keep an eye out um, on Mayak's Facebook account and other social media channels for that link, as well as an announcement on um, future programs surrounding collecting jewelry. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your Monday.